All right. Thank you so much, Leah, for that introduction. And thank you to the Half and Effort. Half and I can never say it right. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> museum for having me tonight. I'm really excited to be a part of this series. Um, I'm excited to share with you all a little bit about um, what I've been spending much of my life doing for the last 13, 14, almost 15 years now. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll go through first. I'm going to introduce myself and I have some slides as well um, after I introduce myself that um, don't, they're not perfectly linear to go with my presentation, but I think that they'll help uh, give you a visual uh, representation of sort of what the work I'm doing um, and what the seeds and the land I care for uh, actually looks like, which is really helpful because growing food and seeds is a very tangible um, thing and talking through Zoom is less so. So uh, I'm excited to share those with you as well. So as Leah said, um, Leah and I have known each other for a very, very long time. So I'm really excited to be invited by um, Leah, who's like a sister in many ways and who has spent a lot of time in the fields with me doing this work. Um, so I'm Keely, I'm Nipmuc. I live um, on uh, Wampanoag land. I'm in Westport, Massachusetts, um, and I farm in Tiverton um, uh, right next to Nonquit Pond um, on sort of the peninsula that was Wiedemu's, uh land. And um, prior to that, I was mostly farming on my own territory, uh, what's called Lincoln, Massachusetts, for many, many years um, before coming down this way. And while this isn't, you know, my homelands, I feel really um, connected and blessed to be welcomed onto this land, as well as um, just to have the privilege to build relationship with this place uh, and all the plants and relatives that are on this land. Um, so... Let's see, I guess I started, I'm very young and people get a little uh, overwhelmed when I say 14 seasons. I started as a teenager. Um, that usually helps ease people's minds a little. Um, I wanted a job when I was 14 and it's just really hard to find a job when you're 14. And so I found myself applying to an organization that employed teenagers doing food justice work and farming. Uh, this was called the Food Project in Greater Boston, um, and it was not love at first sight. I would say <laughs> I was as overwhelmed by heat and weeds as anyone, um, but the plants quickly, you know, uh, I don't know, took all of my curiosity um, and really engaged me, and thus I sort of fell into this, I would say, yeah, loving relationship with both the land and all of the creatures and particularly the plants that I get to um, learn from every day. And it's been a journey ever since. Um, I pretty much haven't not had my, my hands in the land and in the soil since then. Um, every chance I get, I have my hands on food or plants or soil. Um, and yeah, currently, as Leo said, um, I'm most involved in tending a vegetable farm, a movement ground farm. Um, but when I was applying for jobs to, I, I applied for like farm manager jobs and whatnot, um, I wanted negotiating for land to be on the table for the collective that I'm a part of, Eastern Woodlands Rematriation. It was really important to me that um, where I was going to be doing my job for pay, um, that I would have access to land to tend the seeds and to tend um, community relationship with that land. And so uh, when I was applying for that job, I made it really clear that um, land needed to be on the table and was able to negotiate an acre of land to be stewarded by the community and by Eastern Woodlands rematriations, just sort of network. Um, and so on top, it's a, about a 10 acre plot and uh, the whole piece of uh, the whole farm and one acre is designated for the collective, three or four is in vegetables. Um, and then there's pasture for uh, chickens, um, both for meat and for eggs, as well as a bunch of, uh, let's see, two or three more acres in cover crop at all times. Um, and so there's a massive rotation there, um, but the collective field, this is our second season. Um, and last year, <laughs> COVID was my first season managing and being a part of that um, farm and land and ecosystem, which as I'm sure you all can imagine, um, the challenges that last year brought were, very surprising, unexpected, um, and yeah, men. I got to spend a lot, a lot of, a lot of hours there, both alone um, and in small groups with communities. So, 
That was awesome. I'm gonna say, let's pull up the slides so I can show you what I'm talking about. Cause the first picture here is one view of the land that I get to attend right now. So what you're looking at here is sort of a, you know, a overhead view um, with veggie fields in the front um, and an open area. And then way down there close to that water, that water is Nongquit Pond, um, is the collectives fields. Uh, that's what I'll short, uh, shorthand the uh, Eastern Woodlands Rematriation Collective Field. Um, Leah has helped a lot on this field here and brought family with her. Um, and that is also where I do a lot of this seed stewarding um, that is new to me. I actually feel really nervous to say that I'm a seed keeper because I feel like I'm really a seed student and probably will be for a long time before I can ever um, really claim seed keeper. Um, but I try to teach everything that I know as I'm learning it because I think that's um, really the most powerful way to make sure that all of the knowledge that I have um, gets passed on. And we'll see lots of pictures of uh, kids who are always a part of that process as well. So that's a little bit of background and a little bit of sort of general information just about where I am and a visual so you can kind of see, I think, like I said at the beginning, it's really important to be able to visualize this work um, because you know, land is, it's a, tan, it's a really tangible relationship. Um, it's very hands-on. <laughs> if I was in person, I would show you the calluses and, and dirt that's just like rubbed into my hands because, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, that is such an important piece, um, how our bodies are interacting with all of these beings. Um, so seeds, yeah, seeds came into my life a little later. I think that at first I was really drawn to uh, plants and caring for land because I, I connected to the food part. I loved eating um, and I loved sharing food and I liked that as a connecting point. I felt like um, I could see both from the like culturally important foods that I had eaten growing up. I could finally like really fully understand how all those foods were tended and grown um, and what those plants looked like. I could have that relationship and really understand um, from when they were growing as tiny plants till when they were fully ready to harvest. Um, and then I got to share that. I got to take that food away from where I was tending it and bring it and share it to people. Um, and that face, that lighting up face of family members, uh, community members, elders, children, um, getting to share those foods. I, I, I know so many of you probably can relate to this, getting to eat something fresh picked or gifted to you out of someone's garden is a really, really meaningful, tangible, important, important thing, um, a touch point for our food system and for thinking about our connection to land, even if you're not tending to those plants. Um, and that's the first thing that was really, really meaningful and drew me in. Um, and like I said, once the plants pulled me in and they had you know, all of my curiosity available to them, um, farming is amazing and, and tending seeds in land is amazing because you can you can just gather more and more information all the time. You're constantly able to learn new things, um, find new people who have new information to share with you and you get to share it with other people and, and just be amazed and in awe all the time between all the relationships that are unfolding in front of you. Um, seeds, I think that um, many people have a, a lot of different teachings and a lot of different um, relationship to seeds, but I think it's really, I wish I, this is another moment. If we were in person, I think I would give you all seeds to hold in your hands because uh, if, if you have any in your house, maybe you're eating fruit right now and you, you notice the seeds in it. Um, it's totally cool if you're eating. I, I love that idea. Um, uh, but, you know, a seed is the whole life cycle and like an entire lineage sitting in the palm of your hand, right? One little seed is representing the same way our bodies are, are holding um, DNA and stories and genetic memory from generations before us, a seed is doing the exact same thing. Um, and a cycle for a seed is just one year, right? So every year, you're, every time you tend a seed for one cycle, you, and for some it can be faster than that, but for most it's one full season, right? A year. And that seed is holding all of the memories from that one year, right? And so when you plant it, and you give it that experience of the year of you tending it, you've just added one more year, one more season of imprinted memory on that seed. So if it's, if it's a droughty year, which last year was a really, really droughty year, dry, 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 you've just given that seed, whether you meant to or not, 
um, you know, a resilience against dry, dry weather. You've reminded it that it needs to grow really, really deep roots um, so that it can flourish even if there's not so much water. Um, on a really, really wet year, you've reminded it of the abundance of water sometimes and that it can produce so much fruit. And the people that you're probably ate so, so well, and there was so much more seed to share. So every year, you know, you're adding and adding. And even if you don't, even if you haven't planted a seed and someone's just given you a seed, or if um, that seed's been sort of sitting for a long time, it's still sitting there in your palm and it's holding all of those years, all of that information. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to remember when people say seeds are magic or seeds are, are precious or seeds are everything or seeds are our entire future and our entire past. People say there are genetics, there are DNA. Um, it's not, that's not to be taken lightly. That's like truly, truly what uh, is sitting in the palm of your hand. Um, and I think as I, as something I'm learning all the time, it's, it's something that I've gotten to really like deeply lean into um, as I've started to care for um, certain seeds over the last handful of years. And you can switch to the next slide. Um, I have a handful of pictures of some seeds that are in my life. Um, and so in this picture, you'll see mostly corn and beans. Um, I've, I've started to, I've slowly add like maybe one seed at a time um, really to, to each season. It's really overwhelming to do too much more than that, I think. Um, you know, doing a good job tending to that relationship, knowing what not is at stake, but you know, that you have the really intense responsibility to that seed. Um, I think when you remember that it's, it's a good reminder at the beginning of the season, I always want to plant everything, but I try and scale back and remember, I have a really intense responsibility to do a good job caring for this as best as I can give it a good experience while it's uh, a plant and make sure it's tended to and cared to and and that it's not you know devoured or if it's devoured some of its siblings make it um and so i think that has helped me not to go uh head in and have like a thousand seeds i'm tending i'm definitely not ready for that um and the picture in the bottom i think it's the right for you all it's a smaller hand with little black seeds um that was, I would say that the first time I really started getting into seed keeping um, as a like thing I realized was important to my being and important to this whole cycle of caring for, for plants and land and food was um, I had a roommate and I was living in Boston and I had a, a small apartment with a porch garden. Um, and my porch garden needed watering twice a day um, because everything was in a pot, right? And everything, when it's in a pot, dries out a lot faster. Um, it doesn't have the whole well of the ground and the earth to replenish it or for it to dig deeper for things, um, which is a sort of high stakes growing situation. If I didn't water, uh, things would die in the course of like 48 hours. Um, and my housemate had a daughter who was, I think, seven at the time. Um, and I was sort of casually saving some seeds, you know, like things would go to flower, um, which is the, you know, sort of natural, most plants um, will flower. And then after the flower is pollinated, um, it will produce some form of seed pod um, where the seeds are stored. Um, and then they often, if left on their own, would disperse naturally. And the daughter of my housemate just would hang out with me on the garden and help me um, water all of the pots. She counted them all one time. She's like, you have 84 different, you know, containers on this four by 10 porch. Um, and I was like, wow, I think I'm overdoing it. I maybe need more space. Also part of what triggered me negotiating for land um, for my job right now. But I remember her pulling or like, you know, kind of brushing against a plant and like seeds fell into her hand. She was like, are these like real seeds? I was like, yeah, they're, you know, they're seeds. Yeah, they're like, you could plant that next year and you'll have this flower that's growing. And she was just in awe. Um, she was like, so we have to get all of them, right? <laughs> and I was like, I mean, I don't think we could get them all, but we can try. And so for the next like few weeks while that plant was giving off seeds, um, she would just go out and she would just collect them all, collect them all, collect them all. Um, and I ended up with way, it was, I mean, also it was morning glories. And if anyone's ever had morning glories in their yard, you know that they give 
plentiful amounts of seeds and actually can do a very good job of taking over a space. I was in containers, so I wasn't too worried about that. I was mostly using them to have like growing walls, um, beautiful like green walls. Um, but she collected like two cups of seed, which is enough to plant like an acre of morning glories. Um, and I still have a lot of those seeds actually. Um, and I think that was really a pinnacle moment for me um, because I just seeing the awe and being reminded of how both important it was for her to have that full realization. And, and it opened up all these conversations, right? About, about um, you know, how certain seeds can't be saved, how certain foods we get from the grocery store actually have been totally stripped of, of um, the ability to reproduce and the ability to, and there's so many um, things we could get into, right? About how this is all interconnected with, you know, it's a very intersectional issue, food and seeds and food sovereignty. Um, and, you know, I don't, I think, you know, seven years old is a perfectly great age to start talking about. Um, she was so fast, you know, every time she would eat a food and there were seeds in it, she wanted to know if she could save those seeds. And I didn't always have those answers, you know, certain fruits, um, obviously there's, there's things that can't be grown because of this region, the, the amount of sunlight we have or how cold it gets in our winters or how long the cycle of that plant is. Um, but when, when you can answer that, when you, you can talk like this, the corn in the picture um, above that one where I'm in the yellow sweater and I'm holding it or the one on the far left where it's in the container on the ground. Um, that corn I'll talk about specifically in a little bit, but you know, that is a seed where we could eat the cornmeal of it and be like this, this food we're eating, this corn mush or this uh, Johnny cake or whatever cornbread that we've made from it. Um, that corn, that seed that we were holding, you know, you can plant that and you can, and you can have ears of corn and then you're grandchildren can have ears and ears and corn and it can just keep going and keep going and being able to share that is incredibly powerful and I think um, helping our young ones know that is really um, why I've I guess started to take more seriously the responsibility of um, tending seeds that can reproduce that can um, continue their lineages um, and sometimes people call those heirloom seeds um, I think it's funny to have special names for see, seeds should just be they should be viable seeds. Um, and it's, we can, I'm happy to talk about that in the Q and A portion if we wanna talk a little more about um, why or what types of, what has happened to seeds that they can't be saved. I'm not an expert by any means, but I will happily um, share the things I know. So I'm gonna talk now, I'm gonna show you some photos too of what it means to sort of collectively tend to um, an acre plot and um, sort of just show you what that, that world is. So on top of, um, the, the farm that I'm managing for vegetables, I have a 130 person CSA and, a, excuse me, a farmer's market. Um, and then in my, all my free time uh, and weekends and whenever I can um, is when I'm uh, as best as I can. I feel like the group really does a good job of um, sort of, you know, motivating one another. But um, I try to gather folks um, as much as possible to come and work on and be a part of tending to all the plants that we are particularly keeping seeds for um, on that plot. And so um, in this image, these are two images from the plot. Um, one is folks walking through cover crop. Um, they had just planted um, some mounds near where that truck is um, in the background. And then this, the photo uh, sort of to the right is a view, the, the left side of the picture is part of the plot. Um, We'll be able to see more plants um, closely soon. Um, and those are a bunch of kiddos. They do totally help and learn. Um, every time they come to the farm, they're asking amazing questions. I feel like that's an underappreciated um, thing about children is all those questions they're asking us are constantly reminding us of what's important and constantly reminding us of our own teachings, um, of the things that we need to remember and the things we need to answer of why. Um, because sometimes we forget or sometimes we don't know. And um, I find that really helpful for reminding me of what it is I still need to learn or um, the things I need to remember why they're important. Um, we can go to the next slide. This is from one of our community work days this season. Um, and something you probably 
wouldn't know unless you have a trained eye is in that white flowery area there. That's a cover crop called buckwheat, um, which attracts lots of beneficial insects and pollinators. Mm. And we plant it both so the ground has something covering it, but also, um, yeah, to attract all of those insects and, and um, relatives that are going to help us keep our plants healthy and the soil healthy. Um, and hidden in there, you can sort of see it if you have a good eye. This is, I can't really point to it for you, but um, you'll have to see it. I don't know, maybe Leah, you can figure that out. Um, there's some flowers co-planted um, uh, in the buckwheat. And last year we had um, started tending the Hopi dye uh, sunflower. And the Hopi dye sunflower, we had planted um, for a young Mashpee boy um, who had passed away, Bryson. Um, there was a, a move to plant sunflower gardens um, for him. And so we were, we wanted to plant a seed that could both be eaten, would have beautiful flowers, um, and had, it's not, you know, native to um, this land. Um, and it was something we, we had been gifted. Um, and so something cool about it is the hull, the shell of that sunflower can also be um, soaked and be used for dye in baskets, a purple colored dye. Um, so they're edible, they're beautiful flowers, and they have this um, aspect of being able to use, be used by craftspeople for, for dye, which is really cool. Um, and they were eaten like nobody's business last year. They just got their heads chomped by all of the creatures um, that were hanging out near the field. And that's fine, you know, we're happy to share. And we really wanted some sunflowers. Um, luckily, we got a handful um, and were able to save the seed. Um, but we didn't really have enough for um, doing any dyeing projects or experiments, um, giving them, gifting them to craftspeople who might make baskets. And we also didn't really have enough to eat. Um, and so we were trying to be sneaky. And so this is one example of being sneaky. Um, and we planted them in the buckwheat so that they would have a head start. And they were sort of at the same rate of growth. Um, and now the buckwheat have flowered and, and now they're above it, but um, they've mostly outgrown the smaller predators that want to eat the heads off of them. Um, so that's kind of one cool way we protected our seeds um, so that we would be able to <clears throat> do more than just, uh, just, just save enough to, you know, just have the seed. We, we don't want to just have the seed. We want to also be able to utilize the crops that uh, we're raising um, and the different plants we're raising for their intended use. So for corn, we need enough corn, not just for seed, we need enough corn to feed people. Um, we need enough squash to feed people. We need enough beans to feed people. So um, a lot of the goals, you know, it's we, we're learning as we go and we'll find new techniques and ways to um, tend to those seeds and make sure there's enough for people to use them. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, on top of growing things for, um, for seed and for food, sometimes, yeah, we grow things for snacks. I like to keep things, you know, people come down to the field and they're working. Um, this is a photo of someone um, trellising cucumbers, which have been pretty abundant so far this season. Um, and it's a really nice snack to have, um, to come down to the field and be working on these crops that are going to be harvested not till late fall and have snacks. So everything isn't just um, for seed or, you know, quote unquote, utilitarian uses or, you know, um, you know, some really long, like snacks are important too. I think that's having, you know, people have fuel or ways to um, sort of connect and eat from the land as they're working is, is also really important. There's some cherry tomatoes down there. Um, and I think that, you know, helps people want to come more often also. Um, they they got to pick those foods and they, and they can snack on them and they can make a picnic of it or a, a day where they get to work and they get to bring their hummus and dip, dip their, you know, veggies that they're, that are just growing there sort of passively throughout the season. It's really important to, um, to have reasons for folks to want to, you know, be motivated to come out Corn is a long season crop. So coming out just to weed over and over can be really hard and tiring. Um, we can go to the next slide. And um, sort of, yeah, we, the, you see a little one blowing bubbles there. Um, there's definitely a lot of hard, like I won't, <laughs> I work very hard and, and I hope that other people will come and wanna work really hard. Uh, we do most things, almost everything by hand. Um, we, you know, we'll mow and, and things like that, but 
um, all of the planting, all of the cultivation or weeding, all of the harvesting, everything happens by hand. Um, and we also need time for fun and for little ones to be able to <clears throat> explore and ask questions. And so we were doing a, a little trip through the cover crop, which in that photo doesn't look like it, but it was much higher than many of the kids' heads. And, um, you know, getting to see all the little bunnies in there and whatnot is also really important for fostering if these young ones have a really healthy relationship to this piece of land and this plot and all of their good memories and stories, um, you know, that's both good for all the plants growing around them and good for those seeds, as well as, um, you know, good for their associations and memories and um, desire to continue tending to all of those plants. Um, you can go to the next one. So that's my partner, Noah and Emery. Um, Emery is such a curious one. And they're actually planting beans um, next to um, sorghum in this picture. Sorghum is actually a great, uh, it's called a trap crop when you um, attract the pests you don't want on your main crop onto something else. And so sorghum looks a lot like corn um, and many of the same pests will go for it, birds and, and worms and whatnot. And they're co-planting a southern, a southern pea, Noah's lineage and family is from the south. Um, and it's really important also, you know, to honor the, the folks, you know, not everyone who is here is originally or family is, their lineage is from here. Um, it's really important too, to be able to honor and, and allow for space for folks to, to um, save the seeds that are important to them too. And so Noah has a, a family pea, um, it's like a black eyed pea that uh, a relative had gifted to him um, that has now since passed. Um, and so he's been tending it for a number of years and distributing it. And he's talking to Emery about <laughs> how, to, how to care for the peas and how you plant them really close so that they can climb, climb the, um, the sorghum. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really special to get to have um, little ones learn and practice right in front of you and do a bunch of that work too um, and understand how meaning, meaningful and powerful that work is. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so just the last thing that I'm going to spend time talking about is um, the three particular, you know, it's, I feel like it gets cliche, but the three sisters, um, corns, beans, and squash are, are three of the crops that I have spent a lot of time um, building relationship to um, because I think their, their relationship to one another is so natural and because they have fed, um, my people and so many indigenous people for millennia. Um, it covers your whole diet and they, they cover, you know, upward growth, side to side growth, um, ground cover. And so I think it's a really natural and easy place when you're just learning seeds um, to begin or to, you know, to deepen. Um, so the corn, which you've seen, can we just go forward a slide and then come back to this photo actually? So this corn, that's the corn I'm talking about, we can go back, um, is pictured on the far right. Um, and that corn is an eight row uh, white flink corn um, that was grown by Wampanoag people, uh, Narragansett people, Nipmuc people. Um, it belongs on the land that we're tending it on now, um, is the corn of that place. Um, and I won't go into details, but um, the corn originally came to me um, in a dream unexpectedly. Um, and it was sort of uh, shared with me that I, I needed to find that seed in that corn um, and that uh, I was supposed to return it. Um, and that was a pretty overwhelming dream to get. And I didn't know where to start. Um, and I was lucky, yeah, my partner and I sort of started looking through trying to find a source for the seed that I really had only seen in the dream. I hadn't seen photos of it um, until someone shared a photo from the Narragansett farm actually. And I was like, I think that's the one, I think that's the, <laughs> that's the right corn. Um, and the USDA and many government agencies um, have both rightfully and not so rightfully, many, many stolen seeds have happened. Um, and there's lots of seeds that are in collections in um, banks that communities don't even have their hands on fully. Um, which that's a whole other sidebar conversation. But um, this corn is an example of a corn that um, I think is, has both been kept in community and, and brought back into community, but also definitely spent 
and has spent a lot of time in seed banks um, being held by particularly the USDA. And so, um, yeah, we'll talk about that corn in a moment, more detailed, um, but I, that is the route that I was able to track and find the seed um, as well as um, then uh, sort of, they call it recreating a land race, which basically just means there was a bunch of different types of this corn, basically just white farmers who had named it after themselves who attended it for 30 years. So they'd imprinted that place where they tended it for many years um, into that seed and then named it after themselves and put it in the bank. I remixed up all of those, the corns that were named after those people. They're the same corn, just tended for you know, decades by a particular farmer on a particular place. And I remixed them up so that they would have the most diverse um, genetic pool possible so that they'd be as resilient as possible to whatever land myself or other community members put them into. Um, so, and there's value to both. And we, we can also talk about that later if folks have questions, but um, that's how I came to that seed. Um, the second one in the middle is um, a squash that actually just came into my life last year. I have by befriending a seed keeper, um, Bill Braun in, in the town I live in. It was one of the few people I actually was introduced to um, during COVID. And, and he was like, I, I know of a squash that was tended by your people. Um, it's the Hassan Amisa squash. Um, and we'll, the last image is actually just, we'll, we'll get there um, at the end, but is I have a photo of the first harvest of them from literally two days ago um, from this year. Last year, we just were able to pollinate a couple to be able to save seed. And this year is the first time I ate it last night for the first time, um, which is really exciting. So that is a very recent squash that I'm building relationship with um, and really excited this year to, to learn more about and just see more of what it looks like and it, how it grows and, and be able to share it. Um, and then the third, this isn't a picture of, um, that's a picture actually of a different bean than the one I was gonna talk about, but it was the best picture of a bean that I, it was my, an example of a bean I started seed saving um, on that porch garden when I just had started sort of um, diving into that importance. Um, but we are growing a whole slew of different, um, both beans that, that are from the area. So like the cranberry bean is one example. Um, I really love cranberry beans. I've been eating a lot of baked beans this winter from cranberry beans and they've been bred now to be a bush bean, meaning shorter and, and stout, not like a climbing bean, but um, we also now have climbing pole cranberries, which is the way that they're, they were originally meant to and are supposed to grow um, so that they could climb the corn. And so we have all three of those things co-planted, growing together in the field this year. Um, the true cranberry or, um, you know, climbing pole cranberry bean, the nipmuc squash um, from Hassan Amisit, as well as the eight row white flint. Um, yeah, we can go to the next picture. So this is from the uh, first season of growing this corn, um, the Wiatch Miniash won't be, the white corn. Um, so that's the seed in the original uh, envelopes from the USDA, it looks very official. <laughs> Had to take a picture because it's so, it's just such a wild, uh, holding them for the first time in such a weird commodified, like there was a barcode printed onto this thing from the dad, you know, it's just so um, odd. And then, um, the braided corn, you know, from that first season, some of the beautiful, beautiful ears we were able to harvest and the plant as it looks while it's growing. Um, we can go to the next slide. More pictures of uh, folks tending. Um, I think that picture of the little baby corns on the right um, is from last season when we were planting. Um, we do a combination of direct seeding and transplanting, particularly when we're starting it on a new piece of land. Um, this year we direct seeded all of it because we had been on the land before and felt pretty confident about um, the soil and just the timing and all of that. Um, go to the next slide. You might recognize somebody in this photo. <laughs> so, so again, just to reiterate, um, you know, this I, I got to start tending the um, this piece of land last year. It was COVID and it was really, it was challenging to get people, um, you know, for so many reasons to get people out onto land, um, but also really important. So there was a handful of folks, Leah being one of them, um, that was able to come out fairly regularly um, and help tend to the fields and to tend to all those seeds and plants. Um, and it was really just a beautiful time. Um, it was a lot of women too, um, who 
would take times out of their week and come and just hoe and, and be with the plants alone together in, you know, distanced groups and, and definitely the alone part, you know, everyone got their time um, where they were doing a task sort of endlessly by themselves, um, which felt like fit with the year we had last year. Um, you can go to another photo, sunnier day, things growing. This is after they've gotten a little bigger. We had no water um, down on that field. So you see the water jugs there. Um, many people do dry farming for seeds um, so that they really just experience exactly what happens in the climate in a year. Um, and we did that until <laughs> there was a horrible, horrible drought and um, things were really struggling. And, and then we were hand watering. Um, nearly a half acre, which was a lot, a lot of work. Um, the next picture is me hoeing some beans. Um, so we had a load of dry beans. A big part of our motivation for last year was um, with growing those three sisters, with growing corns, beans, and squash, was making sure that we would have uh, winter storage foods because we were starting to see and remember what food scarcity looks like when you rely on um, just the sources that we've been told to rely on and not one another in community and the seeds that we steward. Um, and so we worked really hard to make sure we had dry beans to distribute to the community and squashes um, and lots of corn that we also were able to get a grant to, to mill corn for cornmeal for all kinds of uses. Um, so that's a picture of the beans being worked. And then the last photo I have on the presentation is sort of the original um, the way that I received the seeds in this envelope, there's about seven or 10 or something like that in there. Um, and that's the squashes just harvested um, two days ago. And so as you see, they're a real variety of what they look like. Um, and there's actually even a couple different other ways that they look, um, every shape you can imagine, um, different textures and all those, you know, you can get multiple types, um, like the way that they look from a given plant, which is pretty cool. Um, and there's actually a Wampanoag squash that looks really similar. So I imagine that they must be siblings and I'm excited to um, talk more with some folks who tend that one and, and see, um, yeah, see what we can learn um, about the ways that they may have caused paths together and better understand their stories as we continue to tend them. Um, so that, I think I did okay on time. I'm so proud of myself. Um, and we can be on any of the slide photos if you want. Um, that's mainly what I wanted to share with you all today. And I hope that um, I didn't talk too quickly and that um, that was good for all of you to enter a little bit into my world. And I'm really grateful again. Um, I'm so grateful for this opportunity. I'm grateful for all the people who show up for this work also, um, because while I um, am getting the opportunity to speak right now, I'm by far not the only one doing this important work or being the main most important person doing this work. Um, I think all of the folks that show up and come and uh, build their relationships with these plants with me um, and next to me and on their own too in their own gardens are, are as much important to be uplifted um, because it's a collective uh, responsibility that we have to these seeds and to these plants and, and to eating them and to remembering. So thank you, Leah, and thank you. I can't say it right, half an effort. <laughs> if I just say it fast, no one will notice. <laughs> Museum um, for giving space for this conversation. Oh, Katapatash, Keely, thank you so much. That was a beautiful program. And I think everybody here can tell just how passionate you are about the work that you do and the way in which you relate to the seeds and to the land. And it really is such a gift that you have for growing and tending and feeding people. Um, and getting people connected back to, um, getting indigenous people connected back to their seeds when so many people have been separated for so long. Um, so I just want to say, Katapatash, thank you for speaking on it, but also Katapatash, thank you for doing it um, because it's not easy work. I know um, being out there, day in and day out in the heat, in the tropical storm that we had today, <laughs> the winds, the, uh, the rain, and um, just thunder and lightning too. So thank you for doing that. 
I would love to open the floor to anyone for questions. So if you would like to ask Keely a question, um, just you can use a raise hand function, which is right in the little uh, reactions but, uh, reaction section, or you can just use the chat. Um, so Nancy, you have raised your hand and I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hi, Keely. That was a great uh, talk. Thanks so much. Um, on, on your acreage, what are you folks doing for soil health? Um, are you growing organically? What are you doing for pest control, composting, uh, all that uh, boring technical stuff of farming? It's definitely not boring, um, maybe a little technical, but I'm happy to talk about it. Um, so for soil health, um, well, to answer the organic question, um, you know, organic certification is its own ball game um, that I have not personally engaged in. It's a lot of paperwork. Um, that being said, uh, everything that we do definitely easily falls under organic um, and probably beyond that. Um, we do lots of cover cropping. Um, and so, yeah, basically any land that's not being planted with a you know, a crop that we're growing or raising for food or for seed is in cover of some sort. Um, and we try and rotate and think about what those plants are based on getting soil tests um, to find out and know what um, things are maybe like lacking in the soil or what things could be added or built up. Um, we always leave plant residues, um, which is another, you know, unless there's like a disease or a pest issue, um, for the most part, you know, plants or dead leaves or things that we're done with, um, they're, they're either mowed or they're just cut or pulled up and left behind so that they can break down and, and their bodies can be sort of recycled back into the soil. Um, when we have access, we'll mulch things. Um, uh, occasionally, we've definitely used like, um, do you know Neptune's Harvest? It's a, a fish emulsion, so a fermented fish um, fertilizer that uh, has all kinds of good things, but is definitely, um, you know, can, can help feed some extra nitrogen. Corn loves, loves, loves eating nitrogen. Um, and actually one exciting random cool thing is there was a clam bake at the farm recently and um, left behind from the clam bake is tons of seaweed, which will also um, be mixed in with the soil. So we're, anytime we have access, we're, you know, trying to amend and add and, and whatnot. Um, but I hope that sort of answers your question. Pest wise, it's, um, if things get lost to pests, they're lost to pests. Um, we're, working to put up an electric fence for um, deer um, because they have a tendency to run through and eat everything. Um, and while we withstood that last year, we were hoping to get a little bigger of a harvest this year. Um, and then I guess birds were also pecking at um, some of the worms in the corn last year. And one way we're dealing with that is something called flash tape, um, also a really awesome uh, thing to have in your garden. Um, anyone could get it. It's sort of like, a, I like to say it's like a disco party in the garden um, because it's silver on one side and red on the other. And if you tie it between two poles, um, it kind of flaps in the wind and throws light and it really freaks out birds, but it also freaks out deer. They can't quite, if you do it sort of at their eye level, um, they often avoid the area um, completely. And so we're going to be putting a whole slew of uh, disco party tape um, in the corn um, as it starts to set its ears because we really don't want the birds to be pecking away all the corn on those ears. So those are some of the ways that we're, we're working and we're always, always asking friends and um, learning and taking note of things we see both on the internet and from just talking with other um, growers and seed keepers. I will say Instagram, scrolling photos and just seeing other people's plots. You get lots of ideas too and can message and ask questions. So it's a whole combination of things. We're definitely not experts, the bunnies, sometimes come and eat everything. The birds are uh, hanging out, eating all of, we were thinking we would harvest buckwheat, some of the buckwheat and try and process it, but the birds are having a field day right now. So <laughs> maybe the next round. Can I ask a follow-up and um, have you talk a little bit about all the various techniques of, of kind of collecting various seeds and, and say drying certain things and then how you store them into the next season? It's a great question. Um, that's also definitely a big learning area. Um, I would say that 
what you said, drying is, is like such an important, important thing. So sometimes like last year, we didn't have to think too, too much about it because uh, it was such a droughty, dry year that many um, of the crops were completely dried out in the field. And so then it was just a matter of collecting pods and you know ears of corn when they were fully dried down or um, bean plants when the pods were completely dried out. In a wet year, which it's wet right now, who knows if it'll be that way when it comes time for seed saving, um, you definitely do have to plan more and think about where you have a well-ventilated place with maybe fans um, or uh, indirect sunlight. Um, Funny enough, I often, um, for like things like sunflower ear, or heads, um, I will dry them on my dashboard. Um, and I know a lot of herbalists and I know a lot of seed keepers who dry things in their car. Like if you have that thing across your trunk in a hatchback vehicle, you can dry things on that back, um, whatever platform. Um, and, the, and as long as you don't leave your seeds forever and uh, expose them to tons of temperature differences, the dash, dashboard of your car, if you have one, or have a friend who has one um, is amazing. Um, there's ventilation because you know the defrost or your air conditioning or your heat or whatever is is kind of an airflow to keep mold from growing. Um, and then the sun uh, makes it a really dry environment. So um, that is an awesome easy way if you ever just like you know pass by some calendula that is the heads are sort of got full nice developed seeds and you just want to dry out some of that. Throw it on your dash. Um, and the same could be said for a sunny window, as long as there's not a lot of moisture gathering there. Um, the thing with sun though, yeah, you definitely don't want long exposure to um, big temperature differences or, or full sunlight exposure for long, long times. But um, I would say the only other thing I'd add to that is uh, the winnowing, sort of like the getting the, uh, we call it, sometimes we call it trash, but it's not trash. It's just matter. It's like broken bits of stuff that um, are mixed in with your seeds. There's some cool techniques you can watch on YouTube of like people with baskets um, and you can kind of like throw them up or, or shuffle them so that the breeze will take them away. A windy day is a good day to do that. Um, people beat tarps for beans sometimes. Um, we tried some of that last year. Some people just hand shell if it's not a lot, like different pods, that's not just for beans. Um, most things that come in a pod, you can um, sort of break it apart with your fingers and um, collect it into a bowl. So I, I have a bunch of bowls at my job. And when I'm around the farm and I see things that are mature, I'll just stash them in my pockets. And at the end of the day, I'll empty my pockets into bowls to let them further dry and then later to separate them out from their pods and, and or their shell. Thank you, Keely. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, this one uh, is, what does the process of identifying traditional crops look like? And what resources have you found to be most accurate in helping you to identify them? Can you say that? Wait, is this in the chat? I just want to... It is. It was a direct message to me, though. Oh, can you um, put it into the chat just so I can make sure I get all the points? Yes, I can. Um, Thank you so much. All right, let's see. You okay. ever just hear the question, you're like so into it and you start answering in your head and you miss the second half? That that's probably sure. I think I just need to retype it because it's not letting me copy and paste. Oh no. Okay, if you just want to reread it, I'll pay better attention. Okay, I'll I'll ask one at a time. What does okay. the process of identifying traditional crops look like? Okay. So that first part. So um well that's a hard one to answer. Um I think that it uh a lot of that first starts with knowing, um, I guess I, I have a kind of a follow-up question. Do you mean for oneself or um, do you mean like uh, the seeds are heritage or heirloom or do you mean like culturally significant to certain people? I guess that's my like, I, I don't know if the person wants to clarify that because I have kind of different answers depending on which way that's being asked. Sure. So we can give the person who asked the question a moment or two to clarify either in the chat or if you're comfortable, you can raise your hand. I think what I'll do is I'll move on to the second part of their question, which might be a little bit easier. Um, what resources have you found to be most accurate in helping to identify these crops? Yeah. That's a great question. So um, I think that I don't find one particular uh, like alone one source to be, um, 
to be the most right or most helpful. I think um, when I hear something corroborated or see something corroborated in many places, both through um, folks telling me and talking about, like if I have an elder who talks about a food and then I also see that written on the internet and then I also see a photo um, from a seed library where a neighboring tribe is caring for it. And then, you know, like when it's corroborated in that way um, across many different uh, ways of knowing or different, um, yeah, different um, truths, like when I can see that and, and that sort of aligning, that, that's sort of how I um, am able to sort of like be sure about a piece of information or a certain seed being, um, you know, no, knowing about that seed or knowing about that crop. Um, but I would say that, um, I mean, the internet is a, it's a scary place, but I think seed keepers, um, tried and true seed keepers, people who, um, you know, are uplifted by both indigenous community and, and just also just like seed keeping community um, as, as being um, people who honor the stories of their seed and, and um, knowing the lineage and knowing what they're tending. Um, I would say one really, one cool, like fun um, thing that can be interesting if you're just curious to learn more about seeds and really deepening your understanding of like how much how much comes with the seed. Um, there's a seed keeper named Owen Taylor who has a podcast, if you're a person who likes podcasts at all, um, called Seeds and Their People. And it's basically an interview podcast that uh, each sort of episode either covers a person and a handful of seeds they're in relationship to, or a particular seed and talking to people who have, you know, who are a part of caring for and a part of the lineage of that seed. Um, and it's, you know, it goes both into the sort of scientific information as well as the cultural as into the as well as into like the food part if it's a food crop um that's you know a seed that's kept for food so I think that's you know like starting to plug into some of those um existing uh resources that seed keepers are both putting out as well as um as well as uh yeah just like I guess when you can read and consume what respected um and knowledgeable um, folks, they don't, I mean, and when I say seed keeper, that can be, you know, um, a community member who's, you know, for 50 years kept seeds in their garden and is gifting them. Um, what are they reading? How did they get their information? Um, asking those questions is really helpful. And um, I try to trace those things when I really want to make sure that I have good or right information. Great. Thank you. And um... Just a reminder, uh, we're going to take one or two last questions. Uh, again, you can use the raise hand function or the chat. Um, but the next question that I have uh, here is, can you please tell us a little more about the Rematriation Collective and what you do with them? You're on mute. Sorry. Um, sure. So um, let's see. The collective is a hard thing to <laughs> to fully um, in like describe, but um, I'd say the collective was born out of a group of um, women and two spirit folks who are really holding a lot of um, work that kind of falls under that rematriation um, umbrella of you know sort of cultural practices and knowledge keeping and um, food sovereignty and um, crafts and um, uh, different harvesting and, you know, medicine making, all sort of all of these work, young people who are working with young people, um, sort of that whole umbrella, there was a lot of folks who were um, working together and um, sort of formed this collective as a means for um, both formally sharing resources more so and as well as accessing resources. So um, I, as just a person who was sort of doing doing um, food work um, and who was in community with some of the people who are organizing, um, kind of fell into being a part of and working with and um, collaborating with the collective, um, which makes us such a funny saying, the yeah, um, it's a funny way to say it, but the collective was, yeah, literally just a group of uh, women and two-spirit folks who were like, it will be stronger together um, across tribal, um, you know, both, 
our territories and our skill sets um, if we are working together and if we're sharing resources um, and also like trying to get resources, things like grants um, or access to land or any of those sorts of things, um, we're going to have an easier time if we if we go at those things and, and work on that grant together and, and break apart some of these responsibilities. Um, and so that's, it was sort of just like a natural, I mean, it's the way I think uh, a lot of Eastern Woodlands people have organized forever um, through sort of just natural um, relationship and trading and, and basically um, my role or the way that I engage with the collective right now is mostly as a landkeeper. Um, as somebody who sort of hosts and engages the, the people who are around me, um, both folks who are from local tribes, as well as um, lots of native and indigenous and black folks who have been displaced and who are on this land and who wanna be engaging meaningfully with land and with um, tribal people of this region. And so I'm just trying to be a placemaker in a lot of ways and someone who feeds people. Um, and so within the collective, you know, I'll, in the off season, I have a lot more capacity to actually contribute to that entity. But um, during the season, my main role is, yeah, to sort of be a place that folks can show up to and um, be a bridge to allow and help um, make relationship possible. Wonderful, thank you. So I would just like to say katapatanamu to all of you who asked questions. Uh, thank you all very much. And katapatanamu to everyone who attended this event. Um, uh, but a huge thank you to Keely for sharing your knowledge and your time with us today and, or this evening, I should say. Um, and so, I am really appreciative of your word, your words and your, your knowledge. And I was happy to hold space here for you today. Um, and please keep doing the work that you do. It's incredible. And we're happy um, to, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. And the museum's happy to learn about it and share this great work that you're doing. So Katapatanamu, everyone, thank you all very much. And thank you, Keely. And have a great night.